Hey everyone, welcome back to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman and this is my fourth in my Oklahoma City CNU 30 video profile series. And this is a fun one. We're heading out on an official CNU 30 tour led by Ryan Fogel, who is a local architect and also has a side business of Ride OKC, which is a bicycle tour company. And we're going to be taking a look at some Oklahoma City architecture, some history of Oklahoma, as well as visiting three different local breweries. So let's get right to it with Ryan Fogel. Ryan, everybody, thanks for coming on the Bikes and Brews tour with Ride OKC. Um, Ryan Fogel, I'm an architect by trade. I also own Ride OKC. It's kind of a side hustle. Uh, we rent these things. We do guided tours throughout the city just about every day, too. So highlighting architecture, Oklahoma history, and some craft beer, which you guys are going to learn about today. Uh, this is a custom tour, so it's a little different than any one we've ever done. We're going to throw in some bike infrastructure lessons, uh, some you know, best practices maybe, and some stuff of what not to do. Okay, well first up, uh, let's get on our bikes. We are actually gonna head up this way, so we'll kind of do like a U-turn here, but uh, we gotta go around the median, so we'll head this way. You guys probably just had lunch over here in Kerr Park. Uh, this is actually Kerr McGee Park, probably my favorite spot in the city. Uh, feels very dense and urban, which is pretty hard to find in OKC, just because, as I'm sure you heard last night at uh, Mayor Holt's speech, uh, you can fit just about every major city inside of Oklahoma City. We're like over 600 square miles. Um, second largest in the country, top 12 largest by landmass in the world. So, um, yeah, not a very, um, I guess, good place unless you own a car. But it's getting a lot better. Bike infrastructure is getting much better in the last seven years. Hey okay, guys, here we go, heading straight. Ryan, what's this building? So this building over here is a federal post office and courthouse, built okay. 1911. Uh, some pretty famous trials occurred there back in the 1930s. Cool. Uh, Machine Gun Kelly got sent away to Alcatraz for life. Huh. Crime he committed here for kidnapping. Yeah. And uh, we're coming up on the memorial where the bombing occurred, so right. we're going to visit that here next. This is probably the most important stop on the tour. This is the site of the bombing, which happened in 1995. Still the worst act of domestic terrorism in American history. And um, this outdoor memorial was an international design competition. There were over 800 entries, and the people that won were a husband and wife architect team out of the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, Hans and Tori Bootser, they had just graduated from school and were interning in Germany. They found out they won the competition and basically dropped what they were doing to move here and see this project through. And they ended up staying. Um, Hans went on to become the Dean of Architecture at OU and they've done a lot of other really cool projects. The little scissor tail uh, Skydance Bridge you see going over the highway, that was also one of theirs. But uh, their big idea was, um, you know, you guys were talking about the sky being so blue. It was a very similar day that uh, when the bombing happened. Just a clear blue day on April 19th, 1995. Uh, 9.02 a.m., somebody drove a basically a car bomb inside of a big box van just under the dock of the building here. So where you see the chairs, there's 168 chairs, each one representing a victim. And it was a nine-story building. They're organized in nine rows according to where they think the person was working uh, when they were killed. Uh, there are two other chairs kind of off in the distance and they um, represent two of the first responders that died uh, trying to rescue people, uh, falling debris and whatnot. So um, the other big idea uh, with the bomb going off at 902, that's why each gateway, one says 901 and one says 903. So in between the two gateways, 902 is frozen in time. It's a place to come and reflect on what happened. And if you see the tree kind of behind me, you can see that's kind of leaning away from where the building uh, blast would have occurred. Um, that tree looked like a total goner. All the branches were blown off. 
but somehow miraculously it came back to life a year later and it became a symbol of hope and resilience so uh, they chose to keep it in the design it's known as the survivor tree now and uh, if you've been to the 9-11 museum they came here and got a lot of ideas so they also have a survivor tree uh, only ours is a 120 year old american elm uh, they lived to be about 160 years old so we needed a backup plan in place for when that one dies so we hired some scientists to come in and clone it uh, we made 12 clones and one of them uh, bill clinton who was the president at the time planted one at the white house lawn uh, there's one in scissor tail park and there's 10 others hidden around the state so uh, if you do get a chance to go to the museum on the corner it is uh, ranked by TripAdvisor as the top 20 museum in the country so it's it's pretty special all right well let's get to our next spot all right guys so yeah just a real quick stop here i uh, just wanted to tell you about the building behind you over there so that's uh, originally known as Central High. It's the first high school built in Oklahoma in 1903. Uh, same architect that designed that designed our state capitol building, Solomon Layton, who's kind of our father architect. This is the only Gothic design he ever did, and uh, it was built by the Freemasons. So if you look on the cornerstone over there, kind of that secret society, uh, they, they built it. And uh, it was the first school that was integrated or, or desegregated back in the 60s in the state and now it's been converted into the OCU School of Law. So their campus is up on 23rd, but somehow the law students got this really sweet building just right downtown. A uh, block away from the brewery, uh, my favorite that we're about to go in now. Welcome to Vanessa House Beer Co. Um, this is Evan. He's one of the, the owners and founders here. Yeah. Also the president of the, the CBAO. O yeah. The CBAO. Which is the Craft Brewers Association of Oklahoma. So. so. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for coming in. I am Evan. I do own part of the place. Um, we were founded in 2016. Uh, we started out as a contract brewery, meaning we came up with the recipes, and I was the original brewer, so I came up with the recipes. We actually had another brewery named O'Fallon brew it for us, but package it with our materials and then send it back and we would sell it here. The reason we did that is the five owners didn't have a whole lot of capital when we opened, so a bank wouldn't, wasn't really willing to lend at the time, so we needed to prove the concept first. Um, we did that for about six to eight months um, and then a brewery in Oklahoma City opened with extra capacity specifically for what we were trying to do. It's called the Brewers Union. It has since closed but uh, for two years it turned down about six or seven different breweries that were doing the similar things to us. So we brewed there. Uh, that's kind of where I got my uh, experience in the brewing industry although I had been to school for it prior to that. And then while we were brewing there uh, in 2017, we were building this place out and this place opened in October of 2018. And we've been brewing ever since. Uh, we have a 15 barrel brew house. I would walk you guys a bit forward, but they're currently knocking out and it's probably the hottest time. We were a very slow state to modernize alcohol. We had prohibition for a long time, uh, so we didn't have our first brewery until the 60s or 70s, and then it went out of business. Um, and we operated in strictly a three to four tier model uh, for a long, long time up until 2016. And what that means is, as a brewery prior to 2016, I had no way to sell directly to a customer. That would be considered one tier. So for three tier, it would have to go from like me to wholesaler to liquor store to you. Um, and that's the only means I had. And if I brewed out of state, it meant four tier means I have to go to national brand manager down to distributor to liquor store. There's another tier you have to go through legally to get it into the state. This tour sold out faster than all the other ones. Yeah. yeah. Was, that's was, what I heard. Yeah. You guys are lucky to get in, man. Yeah. It was like a day and it was sold out. They talked about adding another one, but they decided not to. I don't know why.
No tours complete without a little off-roading. You know, gravel is all the rage right now. Um, we just did a 100-mile gravel race up in Stillwater about a week ago called the Mid-South. Brings in like 4,000 riders, man. It's, it's awesome. So, yeah, this is as close as we're going to get to that. And uh, today's tour is only like six miles, so way different. But I wanted to bring you guys to our new federal building. This is the one that replaced the one that was bombed in 1995. Uh, did anybody here go on the Bricktown tour by chance? A couple guys? Okay. Well, uh, Steve Lackemeyer, uh, who kind of led most of that tour, he's a journalist for the Oklahoma newspaper. Uh, he did an article a few years back that ranked this building as the number one ugliest building in Oklahoma City. <laughs> and I've got into so many Twitter battles with him about this. I think it's, personally, it's one of my favorite. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, do we have any landscape architects here? Okay, we got one. So, um, I mean, as you may see, like this is kind of like a public park, but it's kind of surrounded. If you guys can come over this way, you can kind of see in a little bit better, but it kind of looks just like a big, like an empty swimming pool in a way. And uh, it doesn't really get used for that reason. There's like one entrance to get to this public park. And then on either side up ahead, uh, the street is blocked off with barricades, so it's not really inviting. Um, I think that's kind of why Steve doesn't like it. Uh, it was kind of a failed public space in a way. Um, so why was this done is the question. So I'm glad you asked. So the bombing, as you recall, we were just uh, catty corner from where the bomb went off. So the federal building, this building is uh, catty corner. So basically the survivors that had to come back to work in this building they needed to feel extra safe so that's why uh, the walls you see that face the street they're 18 inch thick concrete so they're blast resistant all the glass you see is shatterproof and uh, this is because there was like a new code book that came out for federal buildings for architects ATFP it's anti-terrorism force protection and uh, man it's like insane so basically I'm sorry Bollards all in front. Yeah, you see the bollards all in front to keep cars further away and we're set back from the street 25 feet. So, um, I mean with that, the architect, though I'm a big fan of, it's the only female architect to ever design a federal building in America. Carol Ross Barney out of Chicago. Uh, she won Chicago one of the year, I think 2019 for her riverfront effort and sustainability stuff. Um, speaking of sustainability, all the stone you see is locally harvested from Medicine Park down in southern Oklahoma. So uh, welcome to Midtown. Um, this is the district that most of uh, my friends and most locals tend to hang out at, in my opinion. You know, Bricktown's kind of the tourism district. Uh, a lot of locally owned restaurants and bars here with the first going into the building right behind us. So Plaza Court, uh, that was actually Oklahoma's first shopping mall built in 1927. And it was the first shopping mall of its kind in the country designed around the automobile. I know we all hate cars, man, but uh, back in the day, you actually could drive your Model T up on the roof to park it. There's a little parking structure in the back.
lanes right there. Um, like a two block session, section. Is that like a trial or a pilot? So that is part of our bike walk OKC plan. Okay. And um, it is going to be continuous all the way to link up at some point okay. with our, uh, our main street bike lane, okay. which we'll see a little later. But it's always kind of piecemealed when they do it. Like, yeah. I don't know how the funding's released. Yeah. But it's never, we'll take a left. It's never done in like one clean swoop, which is so frustrating. Right. It's like, you know, leaves a bad taste in people's mouth. They're like, well, like you just said, I mean, two yeah. blocks, like who's gonna use that? Like how does that in induce any kind of safety at all? Right. Because it doesn't. But um, it, it makes sense if it is kind of a pilot or, you know, right. there was an opportunity to put it in so people could tr try it out. Exactly. Yeah. So. But no, that's, that's a permanent one and they are gonna continue it south. Good. Uh, so welcome to Sosa. Uh, that hospital we just drove by, that's St. Anthony's. So Sosa got his name from being south of St. Anthony's. That's what it stands for. This was a neighborhood uh, that was pretty blighted until about 2003. You know, really kind of like scary, sketchy boarded up houses that were selling for around $5,000 a piece. And a lot of uh, local architects decided to, to buy them up and uh, tear down those houses and kind of sit on the lots. And um, you know, when you get a, a lot that cheap, you can kind of take a risk and do something a little different. So that's why you see all these modern houses, which are like pretty hard to find in Oklahoma City. Um, kind of the pioneer of this district is uh, Brian Fitzsimmons, who uh, has got his own architecture firm, Fitzsimmons Architects. He did, um, the big dust bowl place that we just passed in Midtown and quite a few buildings in Midtown. He's kind of like buddy buddies with all of them. But um, so Brian, he built his own house here. So uh, this kind of, I believe it's aluminum clad building. Uh, he's, he does really fun marketing with all his stuff. So they call this the occasion house. That's Oklahoma and Asian combined. Um, he married a Japanese woman and uh, her birthday's on the 13th, and that explains why it's tilted on a 13 degree angle. Uh, he was going for brownie points. So I uh, put a little Zen garden in the back also. And uh, Brian, he owned these three lots here and he kind of sat on them until uh, he had his own clients and um, he, he had those designed as well. So I talked to the city and I was like, did you see how steep it got there after that bike lane ended? Right. Yeah. So I'm on the bike walk OKC committee and I suggested a reroute yeah. to avoid that steep hill because no one's going to want to come up that, especially a kid. Right. I, and it, I measured the grade and it's like 12%. Right. Like anything over 8% is like not good for yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, a bike lane. And uh, they're like, well, we already got federal funding, so we're going to do it. Uh. Try not to get too close to the cars. Want them to be able to open their door still. Guys are doing some big stuff. I think they are going out of state now. But uh, this is an old Sunshine Cleaners building. It used to be dry cleaning, and they converted it. We're gonna get, get to meet the developer, a guy named Ben Sellers, who's super cool. Found a lot of interesting rehabs. And uh, Stone Cloud got its name from uh, the owner, who's a rock climber. Uh, Grew up here in Oklahoma, but moved away to Colorado to pursue rock climbing. He worked for Avery Brewing, and uh, he summited the Rockies, a 14er, and he said once he got above the clouds, all he saw was stones and clouds. So that's how he got the name, Stone Cloud. And uh, in the brew house at the back, he has his own rock climbing wall, so he can do that while he's brewing. But uh, let's go check it out. Oh, uh, the mural here, pretty recently done by a local artist named Carboza and obviously some really famous people, but uh, some lesser known people are in there too, like uh, the lady here with the glasses. So that's Clara Looper. She um, is kind of a, a hero here locally for civil rights. So uh, she didn't get a lot of credit uh, in the history books, but she was doing sit-ins uh, before Rosa Parks uh, here locally. So um, yeah, she does some great stuff. So anyway, Let's go check it out. Ben Sellers with Pivot Project. We're the development team and the owners of the building. Uh, our firm really started about 2014 and 15 in Oklahoma City, and we've done primarily, uh, I say primarily, all uh, urban core Oklahoma City projects, mostly uh, uh, substantial renovation, and we've done five historic tax credit projects. Uh, this particular building was built in 1929, originally as a commercial laundry facility. 
and um, they did linens and laundry for hospitals and prisons. And so it had been vacant since the mid 80s when we bought it in 2015. Uh, and some of these photos floating around are the condition it was in when we purchased the building. Uh, so this uh, is a roughly a $5 million project, um, not including brewery equipment. Uh, the stack there is about a two and a half million dollar bank loan, uh, about a million dollars in historic tax credits, uh, about half a million dollars in uh, TIF financing from the city, uh, and then we got the actual actual equity in the deal is about $160,000 real cash in the deal from our side, um, and, and also Brownfields funds from the city of Oklahoma City. So. When we bought this, there was a high level of concern of environmental issues being a laundry facility. It was really unknown if there was dry cleaning here or not. Uh, and fortunately, there was not. So they poked about 18 holes in the ground looking for contaminated water and there was none, which was extremely surprising to everybody involved, but it was, it was a, good, a good surprise. And so, um, Joel, part of the kind of the stack as well, or the, the organization of the real estate, uh, is we brought Joel and as the owner, he's a partner in the real estate as well. And when we first did the building, our real estate company, uh, we occupied the offices upstairs. And so um, instead of a totally speculative deal, it was essentially 100% owner occupied uh, building, which um, was helpful when you're talking to banks, you know, because bankers, uh, when you show them a picture of a building without a roof on it and 30 foot tall trees growing out of it, uh, they get real nervous real quick. some of the first bike lanes that we had got in the city with green paint uh, obviously not protected but still a pretty uh, momentous occasion when they popped up right we're actually gonna take a left it's a very interesting application and use of the green <laughs> yeah normally the green green is for the conflict zone in the intersection <laughs> <laughs> yeah yes everybody so welcome to film row uh, the last stop that we didn't really get to talk at I was going to talk about 21 C which is the hotel chain that was there uh, it's an interesting ho hotel chain because um, they own most of their hotels in like flyover cities um, kind of like Oklahoma City Louisville Cincinnati uh, I think they just got one in Chicago recently, but they basically have like modern art that they rotate throughout the hotels. So it's ever changing and it's all free art to come and see. Um, it's open 24 seven too, so you can kind of walk through the gallery and uh, it's really cool. Um, that building though, it used to be a Ford manufacturing plant back in 1906. And uh, they made Model T's there and uh, other Ford cars until about the Great Depression, then it closed. But uh, the guy's name on the street that we were kind of stopped at, Fred Jones, uh, he started out as like the timer for the building. He would kind of time the assembly line and uh, worked his way up and bought the building, turned it into a uh, maintenance facility to rehab buildings because during the Great Depression, people couldn't afford a new car, so they just fixed the old ones. Uh, went on to own more Ford dealerships than anyone in the country. So it kind of cool racks the riches story. And uh, Film Row, it gets its name because we have an interesting tie with the Hollywood film industry. So uh, they didn't make movies here, but they made movies here in uh, just the reels. So they developed the films. So uh, just across the street here, uh, that's originally Paramount Studios. And uh, directly across from it, where you see the little spire sticking up, that was MGM Studios. And then beside that was Warner Brothers and then Fox Studios here. So we had about 10 years of um, film development. And each one of these buildings had a little viewing room. So people that owned movie theaters regionally would come in 
and preview films and decide if they want to buy a reel uh, to take home to their community to show. So, um, so there's still like a film place over here. I was I was in that place last night. There's like a little movie theater. There. Yeah, most of the most of the movie theaters have been gutted out, and these have been converted into something else. Except you're at the Paramount. They kept the theater in there, and it just got taken over by Rodeo Cinema, which is kind of an indie uh, film place and uh, they show some really cool movies I mean the theater seats probably like 50 people it's tiny but uh, some really neat films come through there that you can't watch anywhere else so what era were they making these reels this is in the 20s We've got Angry Scotsman. So, uh, we're gonna get to meet these guys, but these guys opened about three years ago. And uh, I don't know if Ross is gonna speak the owner, but he is a legit Scotsman. Um, sounds like William Wallace when he talks. But uh, got his PhD in chemistry, so he was doing like, you know, oil and gas type stuff, but his, his passion was always in this, and he got to, start doing it full time last year so I'm really happy for him. Thank you so much for making the trek to Oklahoma City. I hope you guys are having a great time. Um, this is probably not the city you thought you would be walking into when they said you were coming to Oklahoma City, but there are some really cool city programs, the MATS projects has really saved Oklahoma City and given us, little by little, ta tax penny by tax penny, the money to create the city that you guys see today. I don't know if you've already passed by Scissor Tail Park, but that is like one of my most favorite spots to take my dogs and go walk in or just go watch the ducks at the pond or whatever. Um, but okay, now on to the brewery. Angry Scotsman, we are about to celebrate our third anniversary here in this tap room space. Before that, we were at the incubator, um, brewery incubator up the street called Brewers Union. Um, a lot of the breweries that you may have stopped at today started off over at Brewers Union, a little collective brewing space. Um, started renovations on this building in 2016, took about a year and a half. Um, they had bare floors, walls, roof, everything else in here they kind of built from the ground up. This original structure is from the 1930s and from the garage doors on either side you can kind of guess it was meant for like auto body work and whatnot. Um, the owner told me a story that threw them off track during development is when they found like a giant oil reserve in the ground left over from like changing people's oils back in the 90s and stuff like that. Um, so I thought that was a pretty funny story. <laughs> uh, funny for me, not for him during the time. Um, but he said it the, took about a year and a half, $650,000 to make this space that you're standing in today. That does not include any of the brewing equipment or anything like that. Um, $650,000. Um, yeah. The Oklahoma City craft beer scene is growing. I'm not sure where all of you guys are from, maybe from bigger cities that have more breweries, but um, I hope you were pleasantly surprised by the amount of good beer you can find in this city. Um, I don't know how much free time you have, but there are plenty more to explore than the ones that are just on your brew tour today. Um, so the name Angry Scotsman, our owner is actually an immigrant from Scotland. He moved here to continue his education in the late 90s, I want to say. Um, and he just got offered a good job in the U.S., stayed in the U.S. Um, the name comes from a drunken night with his college buddies. 
uh, English vernacular, UK slang, a little bit different there. So he's chatting with one of his friends, told his friends he got pissed last night, and they assumed that he was an angry drunk. And ever since then, they've sort of poked him for being the angry Scotsman, but he is not angry at all, or I would not work here. But being from Scotland, he really wanted to create a different feel, not just sort of like a little sitting area in the corner of a brewing room, but more of a community feel, a gathering space as we're all gathered here. Um, we're going to have a magazine launch party tonight as well. So we are just sort of a community space. There's folks out right now on the patio practicing their bagpipes. Like, come, come to the brewery, do whatever you would do in any other sort of space. You know, drinking isn't scary. Drinking can be a family-friendly sort of experience. Um, and I think that we really created that really nicely, not only with the beer garden, but our little living room area over here. Um, so we're just... Chugging along, I mean, um, tap rooms are relatively new to Oklahoma. I want to say the law passed fall of 2018 that actually allowed us to brew beer and drink it in the same space. Um, and then, you know, we were open for a couple years, COVID hit, and everybody had to sort of readjust and learn how to shift their business model to survive uh, in that sort of uh, climate, which I'm sure we're all, like, glad that it's a little bit behind us now um but yeah that's kind of it you guys <laughs> yeah somebody got creative and did some designs look at this yeah, I don't know what's going on there ATV, ATV yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I'm gonna talk about this in a minute, but you know, it's illegal to ride on sidewalks downtown. Mm -hmm. And they, the original renderings for the boulevard showed bike lanes. Mm -hmm. And somehow they mysteriously disappeared once ODOT got a hold of it. So they did this giant sidewalk, and it's like, well, wait, you can't ride on sidewalks. But they're like, oh, well, it's like a multi use sidewalk, which is, you know, very confusing for like you know police who's gonna give you a ticket or something where are those people bike twitter all right we got bike twitter in the house all right okay guys well uh this is the oklahoma city boulevard and i think we talked a little bit about this at the plenary last night but this used to be the elevated highway this was i-40 about mm, 10 years ago so when we dismantled i-40 we basically went back with this, which in a lot of people's mind is essentially an at great highway. Um, I mean, technically they call it a boulevard, but is it though? I mean, there's kind of an island in the middle with some trees. I think they're hoping for like a street skate, trees to like slow cars down. But to me, it's so wide that um, it's not very, you know, pedestrian friendly, obviously. So, the original renderings that were done of the boulevard showed a protected bike lane. And then mysteriously, they disappeared right before ODOT approved it. So, I mean, shocker, right? I mean, they use all this fake data that they have for traffic counts. Like, oh, I mean, if I-40 closes, people are gonna use the boulevard. We gotta be able to shuffle people through, but I mean, whatever. So they came up with this giant sidewalk which is supposed to be multi-use for pedestrians walking and also cyclists and uh, I was talking about the ordinance city code I mean you can't ride on the sidewalk it's illegal in Oklahoma City so it's kind of like a I don't know a very confusing thing not just for residents but police I mean we're right on the sidewalk are we gonna get ticketed I don't know so I mean I'm sure they could spin it either way but uh, anyway it's not super obviously dense there's no businesses along it really yet but when there are i think they're gonna have to do some changes but uh here on walker this is our first really uh longer than a mile of protected bike lanes and by protected bike lanes oklahoma city has kind of adopted the plastic bollards those little delineators which don't really do much no it's still good to see progress i guess um, this used to be a four-lane street. Now it's two-lane with um, center turn lane 
and uh, bike lanes on either side. And it goes all the way from basically Main Street all the way to Southwest 29th, which is over a mile, which is like, I don't know, you know? You gotta take it with a grain of salt. I mean, I want really good stuff, but this is like pretty close to as good as we're probably gonna get for a while. It got so me we'll to the it. river trail too. Yeah, and it, it will get you to the river trail, which is a really good, um, we have over 110 miles of river trails or uh, separated trails that'll link you up to all of our lakes. Um, definitely more for recreational cyclists, but it can link up, link up to our bike network for, you know, to get to work if you were to do it properly. All right. Active Towns and I were kind of talking about it. it. Looks like they kind of want to push you up into the the park onto the sidewalk, but again, illegal to ride on the sidewalk in a, a downtown setting. So anyway, the bike lane does restart just here after the park, which is kind of odd. So uh, just a couple other architecture factoids uh, I'll tell you about. Devon Tower, uh, it's the tallest building in the state. It's also the 62nd tallest building in the country right now. If you've been to Manhattan, it's the same height as Rockefeller, so about 850 feet tall. Uh, Devon, of course, is a uh, oil and gas company. Uh, they designed it as a three-sided tower, so it never turns its back on any part of the city. And um, if you look on the grand entrance here, the rotunda, that they designed that as a modern-day interpretation of the Pantheon in Rome, which is that concrete dome from like you know 1 AD. It has the hole cut out of the center at the top of the dome or an oculus to gaze upon the heavens. Uh, this one also has an oculus, only it gazes to the top of an oil company. So I think it says a lot about the culture here in Oklahoma City. Uh, oil and gas is God, it may always be, but uh, that's kind of been the struggle with, with bikes and bike infrastructure, I think. I know the description said we would talk about I.M. Pei, and I kind of didn't talk about him because he's like Voldemort, man. Uh, we pretty much tore down 60% of downtown, so we don't like to talk about that a whole lot. Urban renewal, you know, it was dark times. And that's why we have so many surface lots today. It's like none of those projects ever came to fruition. But hey, man, I hope you guys had a good time. I hope you guys enjoy Oklahoma City. Yes. And uh, yeah, don't be afraid to, to bike around here, man. Yeah. It can be done. Go local. So, all right. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed this special tour of Oklahoma City led by Ryan Fogel with Ride OKC. Be sure to check him out if you're in the city. 
And if you did enjoy this, please hit that like button, uh, share it with a friend, and leave a comment down below. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel, and be sure to ring the notifications bell and select your preferred notification preferences. Well, that's all for CNU 30 video profile number four. Uh, up next is going to be the Wheeler District and a special tour by Victor Dover himself. Oh, and one last reminder, be sure to check out the Active Town store for some fun Streets Are For People merch. Thank you so very much for tuning in. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. Cool. So, hey, that was a really amazing tour. So we went around uh, Oklahoma City. It was basically a bikes and brewery tour, mm -hmm. and there was amazing architecture. Tell us a little bit about your company. Yeah, so I own Red OKC. Uh, I'm also a licensed architect, but, you know, we... Oklahoma City is kind of not on the map for tourism uh, so much, but it's it's getting better. And uh, ever since we passed maps, um, we got a lot of new bike trails and bike lanes, and it kind of seemed like a good opportunity to try to to do a bike business. Uh, my wife and I love going to you know European towns and doing bike tours where the infrastructure is a little safer and people are more aware of pedestrians but uh here we're, people some people thought we were crazy <laughs> in oklahoma city but uh you know we thought we'd give it a shot and uh it's now the number one tour and outdoor activity uh, according to TripAdvisor. yeah it was pretty funny too because we were up uh you know in the it was the midtown district area and we were looking at some of the modern architecture and even some of the residents recognized you because you Oh, yeah. We have to swing by there sometimes. So that's really interesting. Now, you mentioned MAPS, and MAPS has come up multiple times. What is, is, is that an acronym? What does MAPS stand for? Yeah, so MAPS uh, is an acronym for Metro Area Projects. And uh, we started passing that in 1993 in Oklahoma City. Uh, and it started out being like, narrowly passing and now it passes every eight years with like the vast majority of voters and it's basically a penny sales tax that puts us in the driver's seat of development Got it. Um, after the big oil bust in the 80s we had just a huge brain drain here a lot of families were decimated and uh, we wanted to create these projects that would entice people to want to stay here and live their life here you know and it kind of started out with Bricktown with entertainment districts and we did some stadiums some ballparks and now it's becoming more of like basic necessity type thing so we're funding sidewalks funding bike lanes street lights beautification place making and it's significant in the state of Oklahoma because you, you that is your only tax revenue as a, as a city right you don't you don't have access to property taxes and, and things of that nature is that correct I believe so like our, our property taxes are, are pretty low compared to most yeah. cities and states um, so yeah, this is it I mean this, this, being this able is, to get a, an extra penny tax you know on that sales tax means a lot exactly and it's not just funded by you know people that live here people that visit it help pay for these projects which is really nice and um yeah, man, it's it's pretty great. Ryan, again, uh, we were out for a really cool uh, tour yesterday, and I I had a little shot of the the bikes. Talk a little bit about Priority Bikes and uh, what you have here. Yeah, so Priority is our fleet partner for Ride OKC, and uh, we've been with them since 2017. We're just can't say enough good things about them, man. Um, super low maintenance bike. Uh, I'm an architect still, so this is kind of my side business, doing rentals and tours, and I. Did, didn't want to spend a lot of time tinkering with you know maintenance and stuff and these guys are are pretty bulletproof you know the the belt drive uh the gear is all internal in the hub yeah it and, just makes uh, it so much easier you just get on and go it really does you get the proper sizing and then you're all set yeah. it really does and uh i mean they look really good and just i mean the buttery smooth belt instead of the chain yeah. is like really nice yeah. and low maintenance yeah, super low maintenance. Low, low maintenance so yeah it made a lot of sense for us you know the price points a little higher than a, a standard bike but you get your money back by not having to work on them all the time fantastic thank you so much absolutely thanks cool.